Ottawa has fallen behind on its promise to build 250,000 new childcare spaces by 2026. Reporting by our colleagues at Radio Canada found that just under 40% of the overall goal has been met. That's since the federal government launched its $10 a day childcare program to create affordable spaces for families who need it. Now, the federal government has slightly more than two years left to create another 153,000 spaces. And Jenna Suds is the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, and she joins me now. Minister, good to speak with you again. Likewise. Thanks for having me. So uh, I, I know this is a federal government initiative, but it is uh, something you're doing in concert with provincial governments on this. But it's been about three years since this started, and about 40% of the uh, spaces have been created. Are you worried about that pace? What are you going to do to, to close that gap? Yeah, well, I think it's important first to note that uh, the first objective and what we saw quickly happen was addressing affordability for families. And so we saw very quickly a 50% reduction in fees for families across this country. Uh, as well as of April 1st, we have eight provinces and territories who are reaching uh, $10 a day. So that is one of the priorities of uh, moving forward and building this national early learning and child care system. And we're seeing three quarters of a million families who are now benefiting from these affordable spaces. I would suggest as such great progress has been made in a short amount of time on affordability, a lot of attention has now focused, rightly so, on accessibility and on that creation of spaces. And as you've said, you know, we are almost at 100,000 spaces that have been created and announced uh, so far, working with the provinces and territories and Indigenous partners. But there's still a lot of work to be done, frankly, to get to our goal of 250,000 spaces. Uh, but I am by no means um, pessimistic about this. I would actually celebrate the fact that we are having tremendous impact and we are ahead of schedule, frankly, when it comes to affordability. Uh, and we are on schedule in order to see those 250,000 spaces created. So you, you talk about the gains on affordability uh, for parents, uh, but we've heard concerns about affordability for the daycare operators. That yeah. just the way the money is flowing to them, it, you know, uh, having to book your costs at the start of the month, but you don't get rebated until the end of the month, that costs them money. And we have one daycare operator on this week in Ontario who says, uh, or last week, that she can't grow and she blames the federal government, mm -hmm. or sorry, the provincial government, excuse me, blames the provincial government for pulling out money, but the provincial government is blaming the federal government for not putting enough money in. What's happening in Ontario in particular from yeah. your view? And that's a, it's a great example. And you are exactly right in to state that uh, at current in Ontario, the, the province has not moved forward with a funding formula that is uh, agreed upon and that is setting operators up for success. Um, I was on your show just a few weeks back and we talked about the example in Alberta where we yep. were seeing some rolling closures. And I think what's really remarkable when you look at that example, Alberta actually did sit down with operators and they changed the, the, the cash flow issue, if you will, that they were experiencing to begin to front 80% uh, of those fees at the beginning of the month for operators such that they weren't feeling that, uh, that squeeze and those cash flow issues. So Alberta has been able to address um, these issues, the same issues that we're seeing here in Ontario. And I would suggest uh, that the Ontario government uh, needs to do the same, needs to sit down with operators and get to a point where we get a funding a formula agreed upon to set these operators up for success so they can continue to grow and to support families uh, here in Ontario. So how do you respond when people like Ontario Education Minister Stephen Lecce says a lot of the challenges are because of an absence of funding from your government? Well, uh, I would uh, suggest that's not the case. Uh, we've invested $10.2 billion here in Ontario. Uh, this is not a cash issue. This is not a funding issue. This is an issue of the province uh, getting their funding formula right. This is a, an issue of the province sitting down with operators and addressing the cash flow issues that they're experiencing. Uh, there does not need to be more money on the table for those conversations to happen and for those problems to be alleviated. So I would continue to encourage uh, operators uh, to engage with the province, but the, for the province to really uh, be the leader that it needs to be and to sit down with operators and to fix these issues. So, so when I spoke with the operator last week, I, I asked her what 
can the federal government do here? And she said they can put more pressure on the provincial government. So I, I know you signed these agreements with all the provinces, but what is your enforcement role in mm -hmm. this? And what pressure could you bring to bear if they're not moving on the money uh, in a way that is going to meet the program object objectives or if they're just not living up to what you consider to be their obligations yeah. as part of these agreements? Yeah, so um, I would suggest there is a tremendous amount of reporting uh, that goes into these agreements. And so all provinces and territories are required to submit an annual report, uh, but also to negotiate through your action plans. And we've been at the table for the last few months uh, negotiating these action plans with provinces and territories. And uh, the detail and the work that goes into these action plans uh, is the opportunity for provinces and territories to lay out the trajectory and how they intend uh, to meet the requirements, the commitments that they've made around affordability, accessibility, inclusivity, and high quality. And so um, some provinces and territories have signed already. They're doing some great work. Others, uh, we've not made as much progress, frankly. Um, their payments are tied to the requirement to file these reports. Um, so of course, there's always that opportunity to withhold funding if it is required. I would certainly hope we don't get to that point, uh, but we continue to engage with the provinces and territories who have not yet completed their annual reporting and action plan requirements. But Minister, some operators have said um, that they just may have to opt out of the program because uh, they had to agree to freeze the rates as part of the affordability mm -hmm. component, but they did a lot of that before the, the co high inflation and cost of living forced up some of their costs, things they just cannot get away from having to pay. Yeah. Now, I know the last time we spoke when the issues were happening in Alberta, you said there was no more money, but if operators who signed up with good intentions and good faith just can't make it work because the whole cost structure of the economy has changed pretty dramatically in the last couple of years, do you need to reconsider it on that basis? Um, so those uh, agreements and that funding flow from the uh, op or excuse me from the provinces to the operators, those are negotiated by the provinces and territories. That is not something that myself uh, or my officials within the federal government um, are participants in. Those are decisions that the provinces need to make. Um, and again, some provinces have done a really good job of this. Um, again, in the case of Ontario, unfortunately, operators are you know, living month to month, waiting in anticipation of what that funding formula is going to look like. Um, and indeed, it is causing hardship in some circumstances, uh, which is really unfortunate, because at the end of the day, you know, this program, this National Early Learning and Child Care Program, is all about you know, setting parents up for success, setting kids up for success. And so you know, it, it hurts my heart to think that um, you know, we don't have uh, a province or, or a few provinces who haven't done the homework in order to invest the hard work to get to solutions with operators so we see that this is feasible and that these operators can thrive and grow because of course we need these new spaces. So, so, Minister, just as a, a final question on, on a different topic, you're joining us from just outside the House of Commons because there's a vote there uh, tonight in a little while. We've been waiting for some clarity on how the Cabinet is going to vote on this NT NDP motion on recognizing the state of Palestine. Can you tell us if Cabinet has decided on how you're going to vote on this motion a little over an hour from now? Well, I, I certainly appreciate your interest uh, in the vote. Uh, I'm afraid you're, you're going to have to wait. We're getting closer to it. Um, but undoubtedly, you know, I, I believe wholeheartedly that our government continues to work towards peace in the Middle East, towards a two-state solution, ensuring humanitarian aid reaches those who need it. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of work that's gone on. You know, I hear from my constituents on a daily basis the hardship um, that this has imposed. Um, and of course, you know, I believe strongly that as a federal government, we will continue to do the work to support our allies and to support peace in the Middle East. But, but does that mean there's been no decision yet by the cabinet or it hasn't been communicated yet by the cabinet? I know there are still some conversations happening with the NDP. Is it you can't say or you won't say at this point, Minister? I, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait it out, David, uh, until we get into the House. But I appreciate your interest. Okay. Uh, Jenna Suds, <laughs> Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, thanks for your time. Thank you.